He's headed to the old sawmill. Going in after him. It's gonna be dark soon. Who knows that ever stop me? down. Go on. Get out of here. Get out. Well, that ain't him. Oh shit. Two dog.
Someone asked me once if I remembered how it all went down. As if it happened so long ago that anyone could forget. So yeah, I remember. I remember when our homes and our towns turned into graveyards. When the wilderness became our only hope for survival. I remember when the planes fell out of the skies. When the trains stopped running, I got you. when the turbines shut down, and the world went dark. I remember. 
remember when they put up the razor wire like it was gonna stop anything. And the feds ran out of body bags. Bro, bro. And some of us sort of lost our minds. I think it's dead. Some lost more than that. Much more. I remember when we lived by a code, when brotherhood meant something, and living meant more than surviving. Goddamn liar! So yeah, I remember how it all went down. Uh, I don't give a damn about any of that. You know what I remember most? Riding the open road. The smell of your hair. The touch of your skin. I remember you. But those days are gone. Now, I'm a drifter. A bounty hunter. A mercenary. And for me, the broken road is all that's left. But I'll always remember. Someone asked me once if I remembered how it all went down. As if it happened so long ago that anyone could forget. So yeah, I remember. I remember when our homes and our towns turned into graveyards. When the wilderness became our only hope for survival. I remember when the planes fell out of the skies. When the trains stopped running. When the turbines shut down and the world went dark. I remember when they put up the razor wire like it was gonna stop anything. When the feds ran out of body bags. And some of us sort of lost our minds. I think it's dead. Some lost more than that. Much more. I remember when we lived by a code, when brotherhood meant something, and living meant more than surviving. Goddamn liar! So yeah, I remember how it all went down. Uh, I don't give a damn about any of that. You know what I remember most? Riding the open road. The smell of your hair. The touch of your skin. I remember you. But those days are gone. Now, I'm a drifter. A bounty hunter. A mercenary. And for me, the broken road is all that's left. But I'll always remember. Hey guys, we are back here on PlayStation Livecast, coming at you live from E3 2016. We're here in the PlayStation booth, and we are here with John and Chris from Ben's studio. Jeff. Jeff. I, you, I was told you were Chris. You're no, Jeff. They lied. I wish I was they, they lied. <laughs> I might have gotten confused. It happens. We're here to talk about Days Gone. This is the game that you guys have been working on for a while now, coming to PS4. Now, I mean, we saw a lot of this last night at the uh, PlayStation E3 press conference. Tell me, I mean, is, is this sort of a reflection of like this, this, this popular love of like zombie culture? I mean, is that how you guys are coming at this? Ah, oh, no, it couldn't be further from the truth. So, you know, we first and foremost, we're a big fan of open world games. Yeah. So what we really wanted to do was kind of create a game uh, that was set in an open world, a dangerous open world. And to do that, we you know we brainstormed a lot of ideas about you know what would you know what would make 
riding a bike through the high desert of the Pacific Northwest, just super, super dangerous. And one of the, you know, we're big fans of like World War Z. Yeah. We like the idea of having um, a lot of enemies on the screen. Yep. That's one of the things that, you know, the power of the PS4 allows us to do. Yep. So, you know, we, you know, we kind of, that kind of like how all this stuff kind of came, kind of came together. So first thing I want to say is they're not zombies. Right. Thank you for setting me straight. <laughs> yes, they're freakers, and the, you know, and it's like, okay, yeah, people looking at the demo last night probably are like, okay, yeah, it's another zombie game. Uh, biggest difference is our freakers are alive, right? So it's it's an infection. If depending on what how old you were when you were infected, it alters you in a different way. And, and so, more importantly, they're they're alive in that they have uh, needs and rules, and oh yeah, and, you know, they have a cycle that they live by, and that really really informs a lot of the open world sandbox gameplay, the way that they, uh, understanding how they, they behave and what they need. Yeah, and so different behaviors, clear. Right? Yeah. So like in the, d in the demo, you saw Deacon came across a newt. So newts are adolescents when they were infected and they're opportunistic. They run away from you unless they, unless they feel like they can get the jump on you. Or if, you're, if your health is down, then they'll be, you know, then they'll, you have to kind of watch the rooftops. So that they're one type, the horde is another type, and there's several more in the game. Fascinating, yeah, that, that, you guys really are, are I think, Trying to kind of re-examine some of these these sort of tropes that we see out there a lot. Bring something new and fresh, that's awesome. Another thing that really caught my eye, and we're seeing some great footage here. Game is a looker, no doubt about it. I'm really interested in sort of the world and, and the protagonists themselves. What can you tell me about the protagonists? Yeah, so, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, what we really wanted to do was tell, tell a story uh, that, you know, the kind of story that we like to enjoy. So, you know, we, we love all kinds of, you know, things like Sons of Anarchy, we were fans of that. And, you know, that kind of protagonist, what he, what he represents to us is brotherhood and camaraderie and just loyalty. So, you know, that kind of brought to it, but also the skill set, right? Like, you know, how, you know, the kinds of things that a biker would know how to do, like riding the bike. We're seeing some of that right now, right? actually. The yeah. love of the open road. I mean, that's a huge part of the game. Yeah. You know, he doesn't want to settle down in the encampments. He refuses to. You know, because his his uh, you know his, his, the MC's all gone except for you know the you saw in the trailer he's got like one friend left. Um, it's just you know his ability to like stay alive. Yeah, and it, it's not a game about bike culture or about a biker gang. It's about a, a guy who was a biker before everything fell apart, fell apart, and he's struggling to fit into this new world. But that that skill set he had, that badass skill set, kind of has a has a, a purpose. Here it's got a value as a bounty hunter and as mercenary. There's a lot of people in this world who need things, they need vengeance, and he's just the guy to help deliver it for them. Yeah. So it, in being the outsider, it, it's not about him being a biker so much as somebody who's not, he's on the outside trying to understand where he fits you know, on the inside and how he fits there and the conflict that that breeds and the way that it motivates a lot of his jobs and missions. And you can see that in the trailer, right? So, you know, the, the demo is action packed. It's got these, you know, huge vast numbers of freakers that you're fighting. But in the trailer, I hope it kind of came across that what we're trying to do is tell a, a much more sort of human story. So, yeah. so Deacon has, you know, he feels loss, he feels regret. You know, not just that everything that happens in the world, but deep personal loss as well. And, you know, the, the story is really about what happened to him, how did he become this way, and what does his future hold? So tell me a little bit about the environment that we're exploring. I mean, I, the game is set in the Pacific Northwest, if I'm not mistaken. Where yeah, you guys yeah, are yeah. from, yeah. Yeah, so Bend, yeah. Bend Oregon. Um, <laughs> and, the, you know, our fictional town is Farewell, Oregon, and the original name for Bend was, in, in like 1900, was Farewell Bend, because ah. that's where the Oregon Trail kind of split. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so, but you, when you think of Pacific Northwest, you think of Seattle, rain, forests, and what pe most people don't know is that 80% of Oregon is actually high desert. I did not know that. It's on the other side of the Cascade Range. And same thing with Washington, Northern California. It's all very, very harsh environment because we're, you know, we're high elevation and a lot of different kinds of environments. Everything you saw in the trailer is real. You can ride your bike through those areas. You can explore. You have dense forests. You have desert areas. You have lava tube caves, all created by sort of volcanic activity over the last, you know, million years. Yeah, it's not all hipsters and exotic donuts. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm donuts. Starbucks coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad to know that. That would be the, uh, maybe the worst apocalypse of all. So here we are. We're seeing a horde. Um, I can only imagine that it's got to be a real technical struggle to get to animate this, these many characters on screen at once. Oh, it's, yeah, and we, you know, we have... Look at that. We have a studio of, of about 100 people and just some in, really, really talented engineers who were able to work, you know, using the power of the Unreal Engine and a lot of our own code, just, you know, because every single one of those guys is real. It's not like any, you know, it's not like we have a few active guys in the front and of the horde. And it's yeah, kind no, of bobbing like around, every yeah. Every single one of those guys. And, you know, when you watch... Look Jeff, at that. When you watch Jeff play the demo last night, he played it one way, 
you could literally play this demo any way you want. Yeah. You're going to see me kind of go inside the building here. You could go left, you could go right, you could go straight. You could just take your chances anyway. This is awesome. And I mean, yeah, again, it's, it's, I've just never seen such a quantity of, of creatures. They look great too, but it, it, it's very uh, yeah, that's very disconcerting getting that vision. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what I would do uh, if I was in that situation. That's it's very upsetting. So uh, very, very cool. Early on in the game, you run for your life. Yeah, yes. I, I can imagine. And a little earlier, we saw one of those newts you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Super creepy. Uh, geez, th this, is, uh, this is really intense here. I, I wasn't able to see every second uh, during the press conference, so this is uh, fun for me to, to get a closer look. Bam. Good stuff, good stuff. So, um, you know, obviously Deacon is a former biker. He's a biker. Uh, how will the bikes impact the gameplay? I mean, other than the ability to ride. It's, a, it's an important character and tool for the player. It's, it's his bike. It's, it's, uh, he doesn't have throwaway bikes. He, it's, his, it's his ride. It's his steed. And he can upgrade it and improve it and, and make it something that helps him be more capable in the field and uh, carry things out of the field. So. It's, awesome. It yeah, was part of his life before, and it's part of his personality now. It's just a different. It's a different style bike with a different purpose. Yeah, because you know a lot of open world games, basically vehicles are disposable. You yeah. Just grab one, you ride or whatever. That's not the way our game works. Because yep. number one, the roads are broken, mm. right? So we have you know bridges are out, and you do a lot of off roading. So you know you can't get cars around the world very easily. Um, so there are other vehicles in the game. But like Jeff was saying, it's like the bike is almost like another character. And, like you know, the trusty steed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Is it, are you going to be able to upgrade or maintain the bike in various ways? or? Yeah, we're not going into a ton of detail about that. But yeah, you know, one of the things we really sort of wanted to do was ground the game. Yeah. So it's very realistic. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we didn't want it to be kind of a chore right, yeah. for the player. But yeah, there's definitely some aspects of, you know, what you would expect to, you know, if, if you were thinking to yourself, what would I do in a post-apocalyptic world where everything's trying to kill me? You know, we kind of wanted to try to deliver on that. That's awesome. So uh, we're, we're still seeing this horde, and this is really an awesome set piece. And you were talking a little bit about alternate paths. Um, I, I'm told that there are, you know, there's traps, there's, there's, there's gadgets, there's uh, crafting. Uh, tell me a little bit about how that uh, factors in here to Days Gone. Well, so, you know, Deacon, he's kind of a, uh, an everyman. And, you know, what, what do we like? We like to duct tape stuff together and feel like heroes, right? Yeah. We, we like to solve problems with duct tape. And it started with MacGyver. Ripley and Aliens, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a MacGyver in this world. <laughs> and he really kind of has to, what, there's what he knows and then what he can learn. And uh, the ability to kind of make, make things out of what's around the world. Uh, the ability to turn a, an airbag into a bomb and combine uh, disposed electronics as proximity mines. It are, are all tools he learns just to kind of stitch these things together really quick and use them as tools against the horde and against other enemies. And d down in the, we, in the theater demo today, uh, there's an extended version of what you saw last night. Awesome. That has alternate paths and it shows a lot of that. And it's, you know, what we're calling it is brutal sandbox combat. Uh, because what you can do is like, every, like Jeff was saying, it's like what the player wants to do, we try to empower that. So, you know, when you're fighting the horde, there's just, you can, you know, depending on what you bring into that encounter, uh, you can take them on almost any way you want. That's awesome. Now, one thing I did notice, uh, and maybe it's just me, and I I'm kind of extrapolating a little bit about uh, the freakers that you mentioned earlier. They're still technically alive, mm -hmm. so they're not the they are alive. dead. No, yeah, they are alive. They are alive. So, um, is this a game where headshots are, are necessary to take down one of these freakers? I mean, that's a classic sort of zombie trope. It looked to me like maybe that wasn't the case here, but I might be wrong. No, see, it's not about because the, because they're living creatures. Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, one of the terms that Jeff coined is the freako system. Because if mm. the player were to just kind of wander around and just use stealth and kind of watch them, you'll see uh, swarmers attacking the newts, right? So you have this, they're interacting with each other because they're trying to stay alive too. They're trying to eat, they're trying to drink, they're trying to, huh. you know, stake out territory or, or whatever. So. Yeah, you can't. You could take a headshot, certainly, but you know, if you shoot them in the heart, they'll die just as quickly. That's fascinating. That's a really interesting uh, take on that. Um, and I mean, clearly, you guys have a, a very different vision uh, compared to whether it's The Walking Dead or something like that. But um, I'm curious. You know, zombie culture is really big. I'm curious what it is about themes like some of the ones that we see here in Days Gone. What what make those so appealing to so many people over such a long period of time? Oh, I, uh, you know. I, to me, I think it begins with just some latent fears we all have about our own future. You know, the way that we're draining resources. I think for me personally, Katrina, when Katrina hit, I realized, oh man, we're all alone out there. Yeah. Like, when, when shit goes down, we got a government infrastructure, but it's probably not for us. <laughs> it's probably for, for some people, and, you know. And uh, so I, 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 I personally trace kind of the outbreak of the zombie genre 
kind of to that era, and I think nobody can put their finger on it, but it's just, I think we all realize we're alone, and we have to learn how to make do for ourselves and look out for ourselves and our, and our friends and our families, because nobody else is going to do it. And, and that's how Deacon and the, the few survivors survived, is they didn't wait for the government to come rescue them. They, they, uh, they did it themselves. And everybody else who went to government, uh, government checkpoints, they probably died. Yeah. And it wasn't a smart move. Uh, you know, and I think the most powerful experiences, whether it's film or games, is all about, you know, conflict. And, it's, and there's nothing more hazardous and dangerous in a world that's literally filled with things that want to kill you. And so I think it kind of builds drama into any situation yeah, if, you're, if you're facing that. Yeah, I, I would never want to face that. That is uh, terrifying. And again, I, I, it's such a fresh... Uh, <laughs> a fresh array of features that you guys are bringing to some concepts that we've seen before, but now we're seeing them from a very different perspective. Really excited about Days Gone. I know you guys are still deep, deep, deep in development on this one. Are you flirting with a release time frame at all? Do you have any idea when this game's coming out? Yeah, we have some big, we're not talking about that right now, but you know, one of the things that we really love about being part of Sony is that they, you know, they really want the game to be awesome. You know, so like we said, we've been working on this game for over three years. And you know, it just allows us time to develop every part of it—the character and the, you know, and the world and the setting. And it's just been, you know, it's just been really awesome to have the time to make the best game we can. Guys, I appreciate it so much. Thank you for coming by PlayStation Livecast. Really, game's looking fantastic. Thanks absolutely, for having us, man. Yeah, absolutely, one of my standouts of the show. Uh, we are going to hear more about Days Gone in the the days to come. I I think. Hello, my friends. Welcome back. I'm joined by Chris from Ben Studio. Hello, sir. Hi. Thank you very much for joining me. We are talking about Days Gone. There's the logo right here. Uh, you guys, this is a very exciting time because we showed a little bit of footage from Days Gone running on PlayStation 4 Pro hardware. Uh, tell me a little bit about what the Pro hardware not only means to you as a developer, but also kind of to specifically the project that you guys have been working well, on. Well, for Days Gone, it's, it's really exciting uh, working with the PS4 Pro. You know, it's a... Uh, you know, idea, what, it, what it's really providing us now is a yeah. visual clarity that we haven't been able to see go. before. <laughs> it's just super astounding. Um, you know, so the, the, the details of the environment really pop now. You know, the character details, the color, the vibrancy of it. Um, it's just amazing. Mm. And, you know, when, when we first, uh, first got it up and running and put it out in front of the team, it was like, it was a game changer. It was a jaw-dropping experience. Jaws right? were on the floor. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and then tell me a little bit about the specific technologies of you know, the PS4 Pro that you guys feel like have been most beneficial to you as a studio. Well, I mean, uh, you know, the resolution, you know, increase in resolution has been just, that was the first step, getting that up and running. And that was, that was great. Um, and again, you know, it's like our character artist came in and saw a deacon and, and that actually could Just see all the tears, stitching detail. Tears you know, running and, down their yeah, face. You know, uh, in, in the clothing and everything. So all that detail that they had been working on is now, you know, absolutely stunning. That's amazing. Stunning. So it's not even on the technical side, but it's also like, this is the, these are the kind of technologies that also, from an artistic perspective, put that stuff out there more in front of the player as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, and it, it's an open world environment. So we have a lot of scenes where you're, you're going in into dark interiors to bright exteriors. So trying to, to manage that exposure mm -hmm. and lighting, um, you know, uh, on, a, on a SDR TV, regular TV is pretty tough. We do a lot of work to make that feel right. Sure. But then when, when we put it HDR in, all, all of that just becomes natural. It's, it's like you're looking out the window of your office, which in our case in Bend is what you see in the game. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, is this game just based on your office <laughs> and the uh, surrounding environment? I uh, mean, it's gorgeous. Some of it, most definitely. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> and, and I think that's actually the point you made about looking out of a window. I think that's one of the best ways to illustrate what HDR can do is sort of that ability to more naturally show off to the player like what the human eye can see, right? Yeah. Because you know, anytime you try and take a picture and you're like, you can either get the window or you can get what's exactly. you know, behind the window. Yeah. But here, you kind of, when you guys are panning that camera by, um, you know, and, and it's just incredible, the lighting effects. I mean, what is that like for you know, teams like your lighting team, your art, your art team? I mean, is that like just like open up new tools for them to use when it comes yeah, to game it, development? Yeah, it really does, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, and again, our goal from the beginning was to have you know, a visual realism in the environment you know, that, w that we've always been striving for. So once we turn on HDR, you know, the colors that, that the artists have been putting a lot of work in and, and trying to balance all that stuff all just naturally comes out. Yeah. 
And now, what about in terms of obviously the uh, the pro hardware is a little more powerful. People and developers are able to achieve uh, you know more stable uh, you know performance. Right. Is that that must be particularly pertinent in an open world game because open world game is very demanding. Your game is may I say, looking very nice. <laughs> so that, of course, is a strain on the hardware, but with the pro hardware, I mean, suddenly you guys can play around a little bit more. I mean, is that is that a benefit to your team as well? It is a benefit, I mean, and you know, even for for gamers that, that haven't upgraded to 4K yet, right. they're still going to get a huge benefit, visual benefit. Um, you know, even That's in an important point. It is, because in 1080p, 1080p, you know, now on, on PS4 Pro looks amazing. Yeah. You know, just, so. Yeah, yeah. Tell me a little bit more about the game then. If, if someone's just, let's say they just tuned in. Right. This is the first time they've ever seen Days Gone. <laughs> give, me, give me the full uh, summary on uh, what players can expect here. So, so Days Gone, it's an open world game. It's, it's, it's about uh, Deacon, St. John. This, this handsome fella yes, right here. Yes, exactly. Um, he's a drifter, bounty hunter. Um, it's two years after a global pandemic that's, that's wiped out the world. Um, and he, his background, he comes from, uh, you know, a m MC, mm -hmm. you know, so he, he's, he's rough and tough as it is and been, been through a lot, but now he's going through a lot more. The world is super dangerous, um, and it's just sort of following his journey. Yeah, I mean, and you guys first revealed this at E3 this year, correct me if I'm wrong, yes. and I mean, that must have been a spectacular feeling for you guys to have worked on something for so long, and then you finally it get was, to show it, it off, was, right? It was um, awesome. Now, in terms of dealing with kind of an open world, uh, you, you know, obviously, uh, this gentleman is using a motorcycle to get around. I mean, that must play a role in the game design that you guys are putting together. It absolutely does. You know, the, again, this is two years after everything went you know, went wrong. <laughs> went sour. Yeah, yeah. Went, went real really, sour. Really, really bad. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the the roads uh, have deteriorated. You know, being able to get around and be very maneuverable. Hit Deacon, being a biker on a bike, can get around in that environment much, much easier. Does that mean that the way that your team sort of lays out the world, like building things, I mean, does that actually change the way that they're creating environmental design? I mean, is yeah, the absolutely. transportation... Uh, informs that yes. back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All well, that's taken into account. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, does that mean that when, if your uh, gentleman here, Deacon, can get around on a motorcycle, do you guys suddenly have to build, like, start to get bigger and bigger? Because, I mean, you're dealing with fast transportation here. Right. I mean, how do you take, a, how do you, uh, take that into account? I mean, it's just, uh, it's just a matter of, you know, coming up with interesting environments mm. that, that he has to traverse. Um, and, and, but the bike also plays a big part in setting up for whatever mission he's, a, you know, right. he's about to take on, right? So it's about carrying supplies with them, um, but also being very nimble, you mm -hmm. know, being able to get out of a situation. It's your mobile HQ. To. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the combat. Actually, we're, we're kind of seeing in the screen here uh, yeah. that using the Molotov cocktails, which of course look great on, on the pro <laughs> hardware. Yeah. But um, a little bit about the combat design in Days Gone. I mean, how is Days Gone separate from other, you know, third person open world games? Well, again, we, we, we're paying a, special attention to the environment. Um, you know, we're, we're calling it sort of this uh, sandbox combat. So it's really up to the player looking at the environment, seeing how he can take advantage of it, craft specific weapons based on what's around him, um, and, it, and bring, bring those kind of weapons into the battle with them. Mm. So it, it, there's a lot of preparation. Mm. You know, to take, take into lot. account, especially when you're going up against, as you see, the horde. Do you feel like um, hoarders and people that like to collect stuff are going to get a kick out of this? I think so. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Just scavenging yeah. through the environment. It, it, I mean, is there, there must be a survival element to this game as well, considering that, uh, as we have discussed, the world has kind of fallen to pieces. Yes, uh, yeah, And uh, Deacon has to make do with what he's got. Yep. Uh, does that inform your guys' design in terms of weapons, items, things like that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And, and there's a natural progression, uh, you know, as you progress through the story. And Anything you can share with us in Not terms yet. of yet? <laughs> We're so close. I know, so close. Um, okay, well, before we wrap up, I kind of want to know, in terms of you as a developer, you know, what do you take away from the PS4 Pro hardware, and what do you feel like has been really beneficial to you guys as a team? It, it really has. I mean, it, it's um, anything in particular, like any specific elements that you feel like you guys were like, "Wow, this this was it." Once when we got HDR running. That, that was, that that was, was the turning that point? That was the moment. Okay. It really was a game changer. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for joining me yeah, today. I yeah. really appreciate it. And, of course, thank you to all of you uh, watching at home. Uh, just a quick reminder that a lot of this amazing footage that Chris and I are chatting about uh, will be available to view in 4K uh, in the days to come on Video On Demand and including on YouTube. So please stay tuned for that. Also, 
please stay tuned because we are going to be hearing from some of the top developers at Worldwide Studios and beyond about some of the ways they are able to leverage the PS4 Pro to create heightened experiences for you, the video gamer. So please do not go anywhere. We have more to show you coming up. Stay with us. PlayStation. Inside. What happened? I got hit again. The squatters off the highway. We've got to get some men together, go after them. <sighs> Don't look at me, it ain't my problem. They've got Manny. You sent Manny on a supply run. <laughs> I just run the camp, deep. I don't tell folks how to live their lives. Go to hell, Cope! Why do you have you always have a bad attitude? I have a bad attitude. I know. I have a bad attitude. Yeah, a bad attitude. Yeah. What you even do yeah, right Just now. don't talk. Oh, okay. Yes, better if we just don't talk. <coughs> Yo, where are you at, man? <coughs>
easy, fellas. I wasn't gonna let him kill you. Besides, who the hell is around here knows how to rebuild a carburetor? Hey guys, welcome back to PlayStation Live from E3. We're broadcasting uh, through Thursday. Lots of game demos, interviews, lots of good stuff coming. So but much. So much coming. So much stuff. Yeah. But right now, I want to talk about Days Gone. So welcome, uh, John, and uh, whoever you are. What's your name again? Yes, I Jeff. forgot. Jeff Ross. Jeff. Sorry about John that. Jeff. I think I did the same thing last year, didn't I? I think you did. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Sid. I'm a mess. I'm a disaster up here. All right, look. Right Days Gone. Right, it's right there. <laughs> I have no excuse, do I? Look, Days Gone. Big, big presence in last night's PlayStation E3 showcase. Uh, really, really cool sequence there. I mean, it was creepy. It was violent, very violent. Yeah. Uh, it showed a lot of sort of situational kind of, uh, uh, you know, using the, the environment and, yeah. and, and the freakers that we see kind of right. to, to the advantage of the player. Yeah. So tell me what, 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 what went into that. Well, so the biggest thing that we really wanted to do this year was yeah sort of show a more intimate part of Deacon's life. Mm -hmm. So last right. year, Wheat was the Horde, which is hundreds and hundreds of Freakers, all sort of massed together, and you saw how Deacon had to struggle to just stay alive. And this year, we wanted to show off more of the open world and this thing that we're calling our dynamic open world systems. And what that really means is you can use the Freakers themselves against other other enemies, like the right. Marauders that you see on the on the Media Showcase demo last night. Right. You yeah. Know, Actually, I have a question about yeah. the Freakers because, uh, you know, with, with other games, survival games, you know, like, like this, for instance, The Last of Us, uh, the clickers had this thing where they couldn't see you, but they could hear you. What is it that triggers the Freakers? Oh, yeah. Well, That's so good. it's an interesting question. And for anybody who gets a chance to see our uh, alternate demo that we're demonstrating in the theater today or online when it gets posted, is that time, the time of day, kind of drives the density of the Freakers and the humans when they're out, but, uh, but also the weather. So when it's snowing, it's going to kind of blind everybody at a distance. When it's raining, it's going to dampen the sound. So when the player learns these, he's going to be able to use that kind of context as one of many. He's going to play that as part of his strategy for how he approaches any, any, any encounter. Gotcha. But definitely sound, right? Because like you saw in the media showcase demo, uh, Deacon, you know, put down this bear trap and then kind of snuck off. Right. Um, and in our alternate path demo, he doesn't do that. So he actually kind of goes around and watches what happens when this marauder goes into the bear trap. And you hear this gunshot on the media showcase demo. If you look at our alternate uh, path footage, you'll see um, 
that one of the marauders actually shoots the other marauder in the head because he's making too much noise. Oh wow! Right. So yeah. So it's a pretty harsh. It's a pretty harsh world. But that sound traveled, and sound is like is something that can be really, really dangerous. Gotcha. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah, I did notice once the bear trap was down and the guy stepped in it, you saw all the freakers running. Yeah. It's like they heard it screaming. You heard them screaming. Yeah, this is uh, looking good. Um, I haven't seen. I didn't see all of this footage. Uh, I was kind of. I was kind of a little distracted last night during the showcase, but. Uh, one of the things I really like about this game um, is, is it's, you know, we see a lot of open world games out there. It's certainly like a popular genre, but right. this one, it, it, the, the, the feel of it is different. It's, it feels more improvisational, uh, I think is the word I'm going for. Yeah. Absolutely. Our crafting system, I mean, it's really inspired by, you know, kind of the do-it-yourself mentality where, yeah. you know, we all feel thrilled when we make a repair to our car or our house with duct tape and a couple of loose screws and we feel really good about it. That, that's Deacon, you know, he's making use of everything he can find in the environment and they have to scavenge and search for things and employ him in really clever ways. That and, he ha and he has to do he, it. He has to do it so, to survive. So and like you, you see can't right buy here, these. this is the same clothesline that Deacon ran into. And in this demo, the runners aren't chasing him. So, so basically he has the opportunity to see the, the ambush before it happens, goes around it, comes up behind them and takes those guys out from behind. Right. So, you know, so that's, you know, to yeah. your point. And then he, and he sprinkles them with their own clothesline, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? right. So he makes use of the whole buffalo. In and this it's game. a dynamic event. That can happen. You can be out right. in the world doing a job or a mission, and then suddenly right. you've got marauders that are ambushing you on the highway, and it's a dynamic event. There's no way to predict when it's going to happen. You just got to pay attention. Well, is there, is there more than just like a clothesline in the middle? Is there, do they oh, find yeah. more ways to ambush you? Yeah. It's, exactly. a dan it's a dangerous world, and it's something oh, where, goodness. you know, the, the horde is dangerous, freakers are dangerous, but so too are humans because they're cunning and clever, and they're, they too are using everything they can they can find to employ against their enemies. And, and uh, let's just say a clothesline is one of many things. We'll get into it at a later date. Okay, okay. Now tell me a little bit about maybe a little bit of the backstory about why these freakers are being hung up like this. I'm just is that like a defense mechanism? Is it Yeah, a... absolutely. Yeah, so what they do is they we call it the meat wall. And oh. what they'll do is like in this case they have a bear trap under this dead freaker corpse. And what they'll do is they'll put a trap under it and then as other freakers are attracted to the meat, oh. they're all they're all hungry all the time. That's what happens evidently if you become a freaker. Um, but they, but they hang up the meat walls again. It's kind of like a wall to protect the encampment. So you can always tell when you're coming close to a marauder camp because you'll run into these kinds of traps. Yeah, they have all kinds of defenses too. I mean, the first thing Deacon did was trip over that little thing in the in the, the, the tin cans. And that's what drew the first guy out, which is why he had to think on his toes, scramble for a bush, and then wait, and then kill the guy when he came by. Right. And it, again, in, in the alternate pa path that we're showing, it's something where if, if the players are thoughtful and if they take time, they don't just rush into things, they're gonna be able to employ a different analysis yeah. of the train. They're going to be able to look for these things and see them. And uh, that's how he sees a clothesline. And when the players are careful and cautious and assume the world's dangerous, they can turn the tables on the bad guys using their same, the same tools that they're using against the player against them. Yeah, so like what you're seeing now is, is part of the alternate path. Changed up the time of day, changed up the weather. Okay, now, I was going to say, I didn't remember cold, this on the show. Right. Exactly, yeah. because it's colder okay, now, more beautiful. freakers are coming out. So freakers are uh, stronger when it's cold out. So you oh, interesting. really got to be careful when it's snowing. Also. Yeah. The bike handles differently. It's like if you'd seen the earlier part oh. when Deacon's trying to ride his bike through the snow, it's very, very different. Oh, this is really cool. I didn't, I didn't realize. Interesting. So here's your meat wall, right? Oh. The meat, meat wall there. Yeah. That, that's, that seems like a pretty smart move, if I'm yeah. honest. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, look at this. A beautiful looking game, too. And I know you guys are, are digging into the PS4 Pro as well as you make this title. This is one that's been shown off a number of times. Right. I know you have HDR. Tell me a little bit about uh, like working with PS4 Pro as you develop the game. Well, the biggest the biggest thing is just the resolution. So yeah. dynamic 4K, and yeah. if you get a chance to see this thing on a 4K monitor and HDR. Oh yeah. You know, and HDR is honestly to me the most impressive thing because it really sort of simulates what the human eye can see. The gamut of colors is just amazing. So watching it in 4K HDR is is something you have to do. It, it's beautiful enough without 4K, and, True, and then right? you add that to the mix, and it's just it's mind blowing. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, one thing that stands out to me about Days Gone, you know, uh, amongst the other undead games out there, is that you can get so many zombies on the screen in this thing, or freakers I, <laughs> on the screen at once. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how you guys went about making that happen and just getting so many freakers on the screen at one time? Was that a technical feat for you guys? Oh, absolutely. So we have a really, really talented team. Um, some of our, our engineers and artists and designers and audio and everything, but we, I think we have like, you know, we have this one engineer that's literally been, at, I've been at, at Sony Ben for 20 years. Um, Chris has been there like 26 years. Wow. Right. And this other engineer has been there like 20, you know, 23 years or something. And he does all of our physics. And he, you know, he really, really, really worked hard to make sure that 
we could have as you know as many freakers on the screen as we can. And and you know, and last year's demo was no joke. Right. We had 300 active on screen at once. Wow. And you know, the overall horde for the sawmill, we were managing something like how many did you say it was? Killed a thousand. It was a thousand about, freakers. Yeah. yeah. Whoa, and then right. 300 more showed up at the end too. So. Yeah. So yeah. it's pretty impressive. So what we're do, even impressed by it. What do you do when you're confronted by that many freakers in, in, in this game? I mean, I saw, we saw last year's demo. I'm not sure that ended so well. Didn't that seemed well. like a pretty desperate yeah, ending. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you do? What's a, what's, what could be an effective technique well, for getting out of that? Weaponize them, like we saw we in the demo. Them, right? right where, yeah. you know, so that, that wasn't actually a horde. It was a swarm, a smaller okay. horde. One in, t in th this E3's demo. Well. Yeah, in this, in this year's E3 right. demo. So it's something where you can even weaponize the, the larger horde as well. But it's something where, yeah, it's a threat to you. But if you're smart and you don't just rush into everything, you can stop and contemplate how you can utilize yeah. every weapon and every enemy and the environment against each other as part of your tool set. And I, and I think the short answer is until you have progressed, because this, you know, it's like taking on a swarm is something you can probably do pretty early in the game. Yeah. The horde encounters are probably later in the game. Yeah. And you just you just do what Deacon did last yeah. year. You the, the shortest answer is yeah. run. When you run, run. Yeah. run. Get, get up to a tall place. <laughs> that won't save you, but it might buy you a few seconds. Yep. Well, you saw in the demo, you saw in the demo at the showcase that they had, the Deacon looks over this fence and he sees a horde down there. Right. Probably that's not the smartest thing to do would be to run down there yeah. and, you know, and mess with them. You just don't right. want to do that. Yeah. Speaking of hopeless endings, uh, there was a freaked out bear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was going to go into that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, what other types of creatures are we going to see in that state? Well, we seen last year. We saw the horde. Right. We saw swarmers. We saw the newts, which are adolescents when they were infected. Um, we saw regular wolves. Right. This year we're showing the rager bear. That's what we call it. Is the rager, rager bear. Rager. We saw runners. So runners are infected wolves. Ooh. And ah. Those are the ones that you know Deacon kind of ran across. You know, then gnawing on somebody's corpse, and then one of them chased him. And the thing about runners is, they can outrun your bike. And yes. if they catch up to you, they will knock you from your bike. So it's a, another example of dynamic events that happen in the world that make the world dangerous all the time. Wow. Such a cool game you guys are making. It's really inspired. I think it's got a lot of, a lot of cool mechanics to it. Uh, you know, and it's, again, it's just kind of a fresh take on the open world genre. So what would you say you're most proud of uh, as you work on the title? Yeah. Oh, uh, myself, I, I, I'm most proud of the way that our humans are evil. The way yeah. that they just... They, they lie in wait and they want to ambush a player and it just do, they themselves are doing anything it takes for them to survive and it just comes at the cost of our hero. But it, it's, humans are mean and we're resourceful and we, and we do twisted stuff and uh, this clothesline is just kind of the beginning of the things they're doing that the players, we, we never want the player to be, feel complacent when he's riding his bike down the road. You know, there's all kinds of ways for him to be disrupted, knocked off that bike. And Interesting. It, it's, uh, Interesting. it's just because we're turning, we're kind of breaking the, what I call the design rules, the conventional design rules, and that you don't do that to players. You don't knock them off their bike. You let them, you know, they've earned that. And it's just, it's visceral and it's exciting and thrilling to survive those types of encounters. Yeah, it really is. I think, you know, for me, it's just the way the game looks. So, and when you, when you get a chance to play it the way it plays. So, like I said, we have these super talented um, engineers and artists and designers and the game just looks amazing. We're tr our goal was to create a triple-A console quality open world experience because that's not something we had really seen. Uh, and, you know, I think the guys are, are really pulling it off. I mean, I think the characters look amazing. I think the environments look amazing right. all times of day. And it's just it's just fun to look at. Right. I'm just super excited to find out how the world of Days God got to where it is. Yeah. You know, the origin story and how it, it led to these freakers pretty much taking over. Yeah. 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 Good stuff. Uh, guys, Days Gone uh, coming out on PS4. You, do you guys have a release time frame yet? We don't. So okay. we're, we're, you know, we're just working really hard to Deep try to make the best yeah. game. You know, we're really happy that Sony's given us the time and resources yeah. to nice. just make like a triple-A yep. open world action game. And I, you know, and I think it's going to be awesome. I agree with you. I think it looks fantastic. So thanks for coming by, showing off the latest, that alternate yes. playthrough. It was very interesting. I didn't realize it could go in so many different directions. But uh, coming up next on PlayStation Live from E3, we've got a lot more. we got game demos, interviews, all kinds of good stuff. So stay with us. PlayStation. Hello, I'm John Garvin, the writer and director, and I'm here with... Sam Whitwer. I play Deacon St. John in Days Gone. Yeah, and yes. we're here to talk about the alternate path demo. So we did two demos for E3 this year. One you guys saw at uh, the media showcase, and this one we showed behind closed doors on, on the floor at E3. 
And so for the first time, we're releasing it online so that everybody can kind of take a look at it. And I thought I'd just talk a little bit about, you know, what the differences are um, and just kind of like just show you what we were trying to accomplish this year. Yeah, I mean, the most obvious difference so far is it's the last one was nighttime during the rain and this is daytime during the snow. Yeah, and that, you know, and, that, and it's not just cosmetic. And I think that's one of the things we really wanted to emphasize, you know, because this, this, this time we're showing sort of a day in the life of Deacon. You see he's on the drifter bike here. Um, we wanted to show a little more of the bike riding and how the weather can kind of impact that. So we yeah. have this drifting mechanic, right? You see right. him kind of slipping and sliding around a little Changes bit. Changes the handling. Of the bike. Um, that's really interesting. Now, there were wolves there last time, John, and these wolves would pursue you down this road, and then Deacon had to turn his back, shoot a wolf, and he got clotheslined close close right yeah, up there, yeah, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, exactly. So this time you see that he wasn't being chased by the wolves. That's a dynamic event that can just, that just, you know, it's just a, that can happen or not. It just depends on, on when you're playing the game. Interesting. And this yeah. time Deacon saw the ambush and he was able to avoid it. So he kind of comes up and around and behind them. So does weather impacts whether these creatures show up or not in daytime, nighttime, all that stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So especially the freakers, they come out, they're mostly nocturnal, but they will come out as the weather gets colder. They become stronger in the cold. Right. And so that will, you know, again, kind of change up the way the game plays. That's very, very, uh, I, I kind of love that you decided to do this as a demo to show two completely different iterations on the same exact mission in the game. Yes, exactly. So we wanted to have, uh, you know, this, the job is basically the same. Deacon hears that his buddy's in trouble, mm -hmm. rides out to save his life. And, you know, as you can see here, this is a completely different experience from what we showed in the first demo. In the first one, Deacon gets clotheslined, um, and it sounded very painful, by the way. Oh, that. that looks, speaking of painful, um, okay, so <laughs> the combat in this game is fairly brutal. John, you want to talk about that a little well, bit? Well, we just wanted to make it as, you know, as realistic as possible. So, yeah, we're not holding back on that at all. Um, and, you know, and Sam's done most of his own stunt work for this. And I can tell you that when we're on the performance stage and we're capturing that stuff, we just try to make, keep it real, right? Right, right. Well, um, right. There, there was sort of a decision made at some point. What we we've, we've been work. I've been wor I've been on the project for what two or three years now. Yeah, I think three years. And uh, and so early on, I think there was a more. What were we? It, uh, it was more Kurt Russell <laughs> and sort of a two-fisted thing, and and then it, it turned into, hey, let's yeah. take this quite seriously. And what that required is a lot more taking this combat stuff um, and, and showing the horror of the violence that happens and, and, and it were this type of circumstance to take place. I mean, realism, weirdly enough, is the thing we keep going back to when it comes to the, not just the stunts, but also the performance style. I think, you know, it was very important that it doesn't seem like a bunch of actors, uh, you know, saying lines. It was yeah. all very incidental. And we, w you know, we wanted the world to sort of reflect that as well. So yeah. you saw there that you know, Deacon broke into that emergency vehicle What's and this? found some supplies. So this is what we're calling our survival vision. Survival so you saw vision. that earlier when he was looking at Manny's bike on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just kind of a way of, of seeing tracks in the world and sort of imagining what might have happened. Mm -hmm. And here, I, I just wanted to point out that you're seeing in this part of the demo that there are freakers there. There weren't there before because yeah. it wasn't snowing. It was, you know, and it was getting lighter out. It wasn't getting darker like it is. And so, um, you know, it changes up the way you can play through the level. And what is this? What is so, <laughs> we call this the meat wall. The meat wall. Yeah, and it's not just there, you know, to you know, make the guys who put them up to, to seem evil. They're there for a purpose because, again, freakers are living creatures. They eat. That's their primary, that's their primary thing. They want to eat. And so you hang these dead freakers up. Uh, and it, you know, and anybody, any freaker, rather than coming into their camp, like you see here, they would actually we'll stop. stop and snack. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then the same thing with this freaker that they've hung upside down. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bear trap underneath it, and um, they use that because a freaker will come, be attracted to the meat, and then hit that hit that trap. Interesting. Another another thing you just saw, by the way, is that is that, that tin can the tin can trap that you yeah that's a, that's an alarm that the marauders will put up. And this is again some of the things that marauder camps just do. And you find these marauder camps throughout the world. You'll find traps like that. And then if you're careful and you're paying attention, you can avoid them. Because in the first demo, Deacon didn't avoid it and he set off that alarm. Right. Now, now this is the same tactic that he used last time. Throws the rock to get someone to lure, lure him over and have him step in the very trap. But this one plays out a little bit differently than last time. One of the things that, that struck me, and we've talked about this obviously as we've shot, but there's, there's an effort of the other uh, marauders 
to get this guy to shut up, and he won't. Yeah, and so in the in the first demo, you, you Deacon's heading on down the trail, and you can hear that happening behind him. Right. And this time, we're showing what happens. So, you know, he's watching everybody react to this poor guy trapped in the you know in that bear trap, and she just is like, shut up, shut up, shut up, and then just loses it and shoots the guy. Right. Right. And of course, in the meantime, Deacon you know is crafting a Molotov and just takes them all. Out. Right. Oh, boy, this dude. Ow. Ow. So, yeah, so again, it's like in the, pre in the previous demo, Dem Deacon would have gone off to the trail down to the right. This time, he's going to head this way. He follows the tracks uh, and comes under now, a sniper attack. Now, Jeez. let me ask you something about the survival. Okay, there's a sniper attack coming, but uh, the uh, survival vision. Is if you don't say upgrade your survival vision, can you miss clues? I mean, are there things that that you would get if you upgraded your survival vision yes. that, that would help you complete the mission better? Exactly, and you have to. You know, we have a whole skill tree, and it's all mm -hmm. tied to the experience that you can earn as you're just playing through the game, and, and then you can upgrade those and things. What's happening here? We got a freaker tied to a tree. Yeah. So this is another type of trap that marauders will set. They will set. You know, they will basically chain freakers. Um, to the perimeter of their camps, and they use them as kind of an alarm system. Mm -hmm. um, and then that, you know, you saw that marauder there, he was just tormenting the poor Freaker, and then yeah. so Deacon kind of take it, takes advantage of that. Well, and you think for a moment that Deacon is the guy, he's, he's sort of helping the Freaker by, you know, getting the guy that taunted him, is like, no, no, and then he's going to take the Freaker out right afterward. Exactly. And this is a bit of uh, silent sniping using the crossbow. Yeah, so this whole sequence at the end plays out very differently. In the first demo, you saw Deacon use a swarm. He weaponized a swarm, lured them into the camp, and then they kind of did the work for him. There's no swarm in this run through. Right. So the player really has to go in and use what we're calling our strategic sandbox combat. And that's just, you know, stealth mechanics and setting and using traps, whole arsenal of weapons. You see, there's a variety of weapons that Deacon's going to use through this, including the crossbow. You know, he crafts his own bolts. Um, and you know he's got to he's got to figure out how to get up to Manny, uh, just you know using his combat skills right. instead of doing it strategically. So straighten me out those those bonfires were those there in the previous demo? No, they weren't. Right. So that's another big difference is that if you come here during the day, you know it's like in the in the media showcase demo there was like kind of a Fight Club thing going right, on. Right. They were they were punching each other <laughs> and everybody was just sort of getting into it. Nobody's really paying yeah, attention it, to what's it, going on. Yeah. And now it's getting dark and it's cold out. So you know they built these bonfires. So. You know, and again, it's just, it, it's not just a cosmetic change in the way the... Well, it's cold, right? Yeah, it's, they, it's because it's they cold. They have to build some... So fire. it changes yeah. the way the, the the marauders behave in the level. Mm -hmm. That's very... Again, this is part of the reason why I love that you did this as a demo, because the, the, the behavior of all of these things, not just the freakers, but the marauders, everything, there's a logic to it. You can track why they're doing the things that they're doing. Um, and you can use it to your advantage in the gameplay. That's that's kind of what I like about this so much. That, that and that's really what we wanted to showcase this year is that it's an open world game, and you know everything you see around here. And again, we're only playing this two different ways. Um, you saw that waterfall way up there off in the distance. There's a bridge that goes in front of that. If you had a sniper rifle and enough ammunition, you could have driven your bike all the way up there. There's mm -hmm. trails that go all the way up there and you could have used your sniper rifle to take out this entire camp because it would have taken them a while to figure out where the shots were coming from and to get to you. So, you know, that's a different way to play it. There's another way to play it, by the way, where you could have just stealth in through the entire camp if you had the skills to do it. And you could have just taken everybody out silently or, or almost everybody. Mm -hmm. And then you could have gotten up to where Manny's being held using a different route and, you know, just stealth killed that guy. There's no reason that you have to come in and run and gun it like, um, like Deacon is doing here. Hey, how, how scarce is ammunition? Because I see him switching uh, from a bunch of weapons, and I, when we saw this demo, when I, when I came in saw day three, one of the things that I, that I really enjoyed was I was sitting next to you, and the driver was playing the game, and at some point I saw you shift in your chair, and you leaned forward, and I heard you say, oh, man, uh-oh. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on? He's like, he's going to get killed. Right. I'm like, whoa, oh. <laughs> and yeah, I, I, and I leaned forward. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I guess there's some real danger. And one of the things was that he was running out of ammunition. Um, and he was trying to go pick up ammo yes. from the dead uh, He was looking for ammo, marauders, yeah. But, but he I've was seen, under fire. So when we were so. at E3, we had a whole team with us, and everybody played it slightly differently. So it just shows you that it's not scripted at all. Yeah. Um, and then this rager bear. Oh, yeah, boy. the infected bear. The infected bear. That's, yeah, yeah. That's not what you want to see. Well, that, we thought that would be a, we thought that would be a good way to end the demo is to show that 
it's just what for Deacon's life it's just one darn thing after, after another. Yeah, yeah. Right? You're going to save your buddy, you get clotheslined, you get attacked by wolves, or you know, you, you think you're finally done, you rescued your you you know, you've gone through all this stuff and then suddenly rage your bear. Right. Well, as as you said to me, it's not just about exploring an open world as it is the open world coming after you, the open world seeking you out, trying to... Yeah, exactly. That's our tagline. Um, in Days Gone, you don't have to go seeking out trouble. The world comes for you. Trouble's looking for you. All right, Sam, thanks a lot. Thanks, John. It's been fun. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy the demo, and uh, we'll talk more about it soon. have a run-in with R.I.P. the last couple of days? Why? One of my men escaped a ripper camp, got tortured, like they always do. But this time, they kept asking me if he knew about it. Two bikers, two men. The ripper called them mongrels. You ask me, you got a price on your head. No same as me. Anything that happens here is far better than what's going on out there. Perfect. Hello, welcome back to PlayStation Live at E3 2018. I'm Rob Pearson. Joining us on stage, we have John Garvin, Jeff Ross, and Chris Reese from Ben Studio. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. Absolute pleasure to have you with us. Um, also on the sofa, we've got Ramon Russell, and we have got playable Days Gone. Oh. Um, the first thing I want to ask you is uh, the Pacific Northwest. Why did you choose that as a setting? Dude, it's really not, it's more about the high desert than right. the Pacific Northwest. So for those of you who don't know, Eastern Oregon, which is like 90% of the state, is high desert. And that really means extreme, extreme weather, extreme yeah. terrain, and a lot of variety, density in a very, very small space. Fantastic. Um, can we have a little play of the game here? Have we got it, have we got it going? Just a little bit of loading. Still loading, okay. Right. Um, so, so let's... Yeah, so the demo we're gonna play for you today is called You Got a Death Wish, and it's one of the things we really wanna show off is how it kind of tries to marry um, a linear narrative experience in a dynamic open world. So it's right. a combination of the two things. So at Ben Studio, we've always done narrative-driven games, sure. and we're really excited to be able to bring the production values. You can see we have really powerful cutscenes, and then it, segues, it, seem, it goes into gameplay in a way that uh, sets up the open world. Awesome. That's awesome. And what could you tell us about uh, our main character, Deacon St. John? Like, um, what, was, what was the inspiration behind this character? Well, a few things. He's, he's broken. So you saw from a couple of trailers that we've released that he's lost someone, and it scarred him in a way. And, it, and it's yeah. like Jeff would like to say, right. we all, everybody loses people yeah. you know, in these kinds of end of the world scenarios. So, what, what's particular about Deacon, though, is that he was, an, he was a ex-member of an outlaw motorcycle club, and therefore he has a love of the open road. He has a love of motorcycles. Yeah. There's a sense of brotherhood, and you can see that here in these scenes with him and his best friend, Boozer. Um, and so it was that combination that we really, that really sort of drew us to this particular character. Sure. Right, we're going to continue to learn about him as you're playing the game, correct? About him and his backstory and why he is the way he is. I mean, the bike is very important, right, as well, like... Yeah, we almost consider the bike to be another character. Yeah. Because you only get one, and you're constantly upgrading it, you're constantly trying to repair it, you need to keep it refueled, 
and oh, if you lose you it, you got to go whistle. find it, and you got to, and you, you know, you can't whistle for a new one. So, <laughs> you can't yeah. right, like so. a horse. <laughs> yeah, the refueling mechanic is a huge game design choice. I really, really like that. Can you talk more about how important it's going to be to be able to find fuel? Sorry. <laughs> so the refueling mechanic, and actually, you have to find gas to keep your bike going. It's a mechanic we haven't really seen done to this extent before. Can you talk more about that and how it changes the gameplay? Well, like in this demo, one of the things that Jeff, Jeff's taking the run and gun approach. So we we like to call it um, uh, sandbox combat. So basically, what you can do is you can run and gun, you can stealth your way through, and you, your goal here is to get and find a bike part, right? So you're here actually for kind of a trivial reason. You've risked your friend's life to come and get a part for your bike. And so that shows a little bit about Deacon's character. But then as, as you watch Jeff play through, through this wide linear sequence, um, he can play it a hundred different ways. And if you watch other people play, you'll see that, okay, they didn't take this route. They didn't stop and check the trunk of this police car. Um, and those are kind of like our treasure chests throughout the world. So you're always on the lookout for those because that's how you're gonna find ammo and health kits. And then you're seeing one of our stealth mechanics here. If you're quiet, if you, if you crouch walk, and you walk up behind an enemy, then you have the opportunity for a stealth takedown. And what can you tell us about the Freakers? Because they're quite, quite unique. I and mean, we've seen you know, a fair few undead enemies in video games before. What makes the Freakers unique? And what, and what was your decision making behind making them the way they are? They're alive. They're alive. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're not zombies. They're alive. And so that, that, you know, that sounds trivial, but it's not, because it basically means we have a full day-night cycle in the game. Right. And they have, si they have things that they do. They have, there's an ecosystem. And they have to eat, they have to drink, they have to hibernate. And so you will find them, like in, in this scenario, you'll see that there's some nests, and Freakers build nests um, for reasons you discover while you're playing the game. And then you can take those nest zones out in order to free up fast travel routes. Um, so you know, it becomes part of the metagame. But Freakers are evolving. They're living right. creatures who have been affected by this, by this virus. And there's several different types. And some of our trailers you've seen, we've shown the Screamer, which is a female that can have sort of alarm system that will bring in more Freakers. Right. We have uh, the infected bear, so it, it, affect, it infects animals. In our last trailer, we showed Mountain crows, lion and the crows. Right? So yeah. you have, yeah, so, the, you know, so it's just it, it's a wide variety of challenges for the player. And like we said, the world comes for you, and that's part of it is that these creatures are always after you, and at night they're stronger. Yeah. If it starts raining, they become stronger. But we've seen him, I've seen in previous trailers uh, Deacon actually utilizing the Freakers as a weapon against his enemy as well. So you can actually use them to your advantage as well, as well as the environment itself. Yeah, absolutely. We call it the Freako system. So in this scenario, there's not a lot of chance for that. But if he were fighting marauders or rippers, right. then he could find a nearby swarm. It's an open world, so you can just explore. You can find other tools like you know, like a, like a swarm or a freaker bear, and you could bring them into an enemy right. camp and watch the, you know, watch the sort of mayhem that, that happens. I guess you've got to be careful, though. You don't yeah, get kind of sucked right. into it. Yeah. <laughs> I like this gun, you guys. Well, so you have melee combat and you have gun combat. Can you talk about how you designed and balanced for both? That's what I the, uh, you know, it's like so many different scenarios require the player to determine how they want to play it. Right, so that's why we have like this full set of stealth mechanics. Um, we have a full set of weapons that you can upgrade, and you ha in order to do that, you have to go to the human encampment. So there's there's survivor encampments in the world, the only places in the world where it's safe, and you have to do jobs and missions with them in order to um, to earn trust. And then once you earn trust, the the merchants there will sell you. Ah, oh, I like that. And then they, you know, it's like, and if you want to upgrade your shotgun, or you want to upgrade, or you want to buy a silencer for it then you have to have enough trust at that encampment in order to do that. Booster, you there? I found the part. I'm heading nope, got the bike part. He's not having a good time. This is the inside of the Crazy Willie's truck stop, and that's one of the other things we wanted Boopers. to point out is that Boopers. it's full open world, but there is, you, it, there's a lot of exploration in the game. All of the building interiors are accessible. There's no load times to get in and outside of a building or to go between regions. This is in the Belknap Wilderness, um, and the whole area is just completely explorable. And then these are the Rippers that I mentioned earlier. So these are one of the cults in the game. are dead symbols of a dead man. Dead symbols of the lost. Get off me, bitches! 
Biker Man! You must be brought low, Biker Man. For you are lost, and we are found. Oh, yeah, that's gonna hurt. So you can see they're not very friendly. No. <laughs> You've talked about having freedom in terms of how you approach missions. So you can you can approach them stealthily. You can go in all guns blazing if you want to. Um, what kind of freedom do you have in terms of the mission structure? In terms of the story? Can you do you get to make story choices in the game, or is it like sort of like a linear narrative path you're going to be taking? Yeah, there's there's several key places where you have to choose. Um, what Deacon is going to do in a key situation. So we, re right. we released a bunch of footage last month, and if you watch carefully, you'll see that there's a moment where Deacon has the choice to take a man's life or to force Boozer to do it. Right. And that will have an impact on Boozer's morale. So your best friend, how he feels about you, how he feels about the world, that's kind of up to you as the player. Awesome. Did you just die? Yeah, hey, he died. we just wanted to prove that it, <laughs> we're showing that was our scripted. You're, you're keeping <laughs> that really what just happened? We wanted to prove that it was real. That was. And you will die in this game. Yeah. Yes, you, you will die a lot. Hey, uh, all right, right, so you tried doing sort of a stealthy approach, and now you're just gonna go in with a shotgun and blow them away. Look at that hit shot. <laughs> or baseball bat. That works. Yeah. Can you tell us anything about what has happened in the world? You know, why are we in this post-apocalyptic situation? Like, are you able to reveal, like, kind of what, what has happened, what has led to this transition? Yeah, you know, it's one of those things that we really want the player to sort of learn as they go. So there are answers. Right. Um, but you have to explore. Uh, there's a, you know, we have, we, we've, we've introduced this group called Nero, which is our National Emergency Response Organization. They're out in the world. They have these MMUs that you're trying to right. um, break into in order to get medical supplies. They, they're part of the story. And, you know, obviously Deacon has lost somebody. We saw that in a trailer. That's part of the story. And as far as, like, the pandemic and the hordes that you run into constantly, th these all sort of weave together to, to sort of explain where how we got, you know, yeah. to this place and this world. Cool. Um, and we're really excited to have players get into the world and just sort of explore and, and let us know what they think. I mean, it's looking fantastic. I can't yeah. wait to just get around on the bike. The bike looks like really, really cool. Like, how far can you upgrade the bike? How, how far does it go? Like, uh... I couldn't hear, sorry. How many, how many, how, how far can you upgrade the bike? How many parts do you think there oh, are? There's at least uh, 20 categories of things you can upgrade. Right. They're all functional, plus all kinds of ways to tweak it visually, you know, from a, from a paint job to a custom skin theme. Um, and all kinds of just visual, actual hardware upgrades, mm -hmm. but a ton. You can really make it your own. Awesome. Well, John, Jeff, Chris, thank you so much for your time. Um, Ramon, is there anything else you want to ask? Days gone. We also got a release date. Yes, it does. February 22nd, 2019. Fantastic. Yeah, we're February. really excited. Yep. February 22nd, can't wait. Well, guys, thank you so much for your time. The game is looking absolutely fantastic. We have got a lot more coming up from PlayStation Live at E3. We've got an incredible lineup of games to show you, so please stay with us. We'll be back right soon. PlayStation. The world of days gone is breathtaking. You'll be tempted to stop and look out at the lush valleys, the many rivers and waterfalls, but don't. You're not a tourist here. You're fighting to survive. Scarred by ancient volcanoes, 
extreme environments like lava fields and caves make perfect hideouts for marauders. Enemy camps are dangerous because their locations are so varied, encouraging you to use different tactics and strategies. Riding cross country through dense forests or on narrow trails through steep ravines will push you to your limit. Riding through abandoned truck stops, small towns, infested logging camps is even more dangerous. Early on, as the pandemic spread, trainloads of corpses were brought into the wilderness for mass burial. These grave sites are now feeding grounds for freakers, making for some deadly rides and intense horde fights. Weather, harsh and unpredictable. In the northern Cascade region, heavy rain will muddy up those windy trails. Snow in the mountains and foothills will make the freakers even stronger and more dangerous. With six regions, Filled with abandoned Nero checkpoints, survivor camps, choked off tunnels, explore the world of days gone at your peril. Well, uh, traditionally, the, the groom goes first. I'll, I'll go first. Deacon, I want you to know that that's how much you mean to me. I was gonna love you. And I ain't never gonna leave you. You know, we never talked about it while we still wore the colors. All this time out in the freak show when shit like this didn't matter anymore. And we wrote out a farewell without Sarah. I knew that we were 
leaving everything behind. What did you do? Everything that mattered was gone. Folks here in a lot of pain, Deke. You find his stash. You bring it to me. To me, Deke. You do that, we'll see what we can do for you. Deke, Deke, bro, bro. What kind of man he is. What he's done. He done any worse than you? Ricky? How about me? You're afraid to be here. You're afraid to be a part of something. We need you here, and that scares the hell out of you. We have to look out for each other. It's all we got. You could have saved a few lives. There was no hope, there was no time, there was no room, okay? Then we'd already turned on each other by the time the hordes arrived. Ah! Hope you're right about your old lady, Deke. You gotta ask yourself, what does it matter if everyone else is dead? Ben Studio is really about making a game that we want to play. Ben Studio, from a development perspective, to me means a studio that's kind of punching outside its weight class. It's really kind of biting off a lot and chewing it and doing things that people didn't think were possible, and we just kind of said, we're gonna make this really big game called Days Gone. When we were tossing around ideas for a new IP, because we were given the chance to say, hey, Ben Studio, you can make something brand new. Something, you're just gonna create this thing and create a world and create characters and create the gameplay experience. What we've always done is single player narrative driven games. You know, all the Siphon Filter games and Resistance Retribution and, and Uncharted, of course, we learned so much from working on Uncharted for how to tell that kind of a story. From the start of the process, we had about 40 to 50 people, but we realized it's next gen, it's big, we need to grow. And so we brought people on strategically to kind of, you know, from, from other AAA studios to kind of really help us, you know, up our game in every department. At this point, we're sitting at about 130 people total in the studio. So it's much bigger than we've ever been, but still way smaller than you would expect for a game this big. There is a lot of passion in the studio for the things that make up the game. We have a lot of guys at the studio that have Harleys and other types of bikes, and they all ride. We got a lot of people who, you know, longtime bikers and, you know, new bikers, uh, you know, older guys like myself who kind of come into the fold and really wish we'd done it sooner. But it's, it's, it's a strong culture. We go on rides, and it really kind of helps us relate to the experiences. I think that that's where the sort of the mojo in the studio comes in is we have guys who are immensely talented at what they do. Like one engineer spearheaded the entire horde as an example, figured out a way to get 500 creatures on the screen at the same time. I mean, that's an amazing achievement. And that's just one example where we have like peak individuals working at the top of their game. And that's the only reason Days Gone exists. Building an open world horde game with a motorcycle, new IP, all these things at once, and a new engine, a new team. I think that it's just our ability to kind of declare, this is our mission statement, this is our goal, and just kind of do whatever it takes to achieve it. I think that that's our superpower. And we just went for it. In a way, I think that's like Deacon from the game, going up against a horde. That's been a metaphor for us making Days Gone. And I think that's only possible at Ben's studio.